Professor Michael Burlingame, after Pres uh, Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860, he took a train trip from Springfield, Illinois to Washington, D.C., and one of the stops was in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, and this is what he said to the people there. I have been elected to fill an important office for a brief period and am now, in your eyes, invested with an influence which will soon pass away. But should my administration prove to be a very wicked one, or what is more probable, a very foolish one, if you, the people, are but true to yourselves and to the Constitution, there is but little harm I can do, thank God. What does that say about Abraham Lincoln? Abraham Lincoln was a profoundly modest man. One of the most moving quotes that uh, I treasure is what he said shortly before he was killed. He told a good friend of his, he said, if I do not leave this place a wiser man, I shall leave it a better man for having learned here what a very poor sort of man I really am. And for Abraham Lincoln to have said that is truly remarkable. And I think that he said that just before, as you point out, before he was inaugurated, and the statement that I just quoted just before he was killed, illustrates a very important aspect of Lincoln's character. That is that it is true that power tends to corrupt most people, but it did not corrupt him. It's extraordinary. And was that true throughout his life? Yes. Yes, his, his modesty was a quality that, that his friends commented on uh, from the time he was young. But what about the lifting of habeas corpus during the war? Did that speak to his modesty? Or? Well, the lifting of habeas corpus, the suspension of the right of habeas corpus, was, uh, in his view, justified by the Constitution. The Constitution says that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus may be suspended in times of foreign invasion or domestic rebellion. And if there was ever a case of domestic rebellion, it was the Civil War. Michael Burlingame, you have written Abraham Lincoln, A Life, 1,800 plus pages of text. What possessed you? I was, as a, an undergraduate, strongly influenced by a very influential uh, instructor, David Herbert Donald, who was also a very eminent Lincoln biographer. And I was a freshman at college and, and came under his influence, and he took me under his wing, made me his research assistant. He couldn't have been more nurturant and supportive and kind uh, as a mentor. I followed him after he left Princeton, where I was an undergraduate. He left after my sophomore year. I went down to Johns Hopkins where he had moved and studied under his aegis. And if he had been a medieval historian, perhaps I would be writing uh, about medieval history. But uh, it was his influence that was really uh, most important in shaping my decision to become a Lincoln scholar. And this is your 12th book on Abraham Lincoln. Yes. The, I've, I've edited several volumes of Lincoln primary source material and have written a psychological study of Lincoln called The Inner World of Abraham Lincoln, which I really wanted to call Shrink and Lincoln but my publisher was not, uh, not willing to go along with that. Um, and uh, in the course of writing The Inner World of Abraham Lincoln, I discovered a lot of new raw information about Lincoln, which quite surprised me. But where did you discover this? Well, the, the first place that I discovered it was in the unpublished notes of the early biographers of Lincoln. They had gone out and interviewed people who had known Lincoln or whose parents had known Lincoln, and their research notes wound up in their, some of the research notes wound up in their books, but a lot of the material, it turned out, didn't make it into their books. Publishers are always saying, your book is too long, and cut it down. And believe it or not, that's what my publisher told me about this volume. <laughs> um, and uh, so I went to look at their research notes. And I found all kinds of material that had been left on the cutting room floor, including some extraordinary new insights into Lincoln uh, g given by his friends who were interviewed by these early biographers. Such as? Uh, well, uh, the early biographers would be uh, John G. Nicolay and John Hay, who were his White House secretaries. Uh, Ida Tarbell was uh, a muckraking journalist who also did a lot of work on Lincoln and, and had interviewed people. And so I went out to look at the papers of Ida Tarbell at Allegheny College and the Nicolay and Hay papers at Brown University and uh, in Springfield, Illinois and uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana and elsewhere and found all kinds of fascinating new material in these, in these interviews. And then I started to do newspaper research. And most of the historians who write about Lincoln and the Civil War focus on New York newspapers for the obvious reason that New York newspapers had the biggest staffs, they had the biggest budgets, and therefore they had the most comprehensive coverage. But uh, it turns out that if you really want to know what Lincoln was saying, you'd go to other newspapers as well. Because if a, an Ohio general, say, or an Ohio congressman, or an Ohio uh, senator, speaks to the president and then leaves the White House, does he go and talk to somebody from the New York Tribune, or the New York Herald, the New York Times? No, he probably goes and talks to the Cincinnati commercial 
friend of his or the Columbus, Ohio State Journal reporter who's been a friend of his or the Cleveland Plain Dealer. And so if you look through all these newspapers during the Civil War, and it's a tedious job, you sit in front of a microfilm reader and you turn the crank, and, but if you do that, you find all kinds of new information, um, which, which really helps us better to understand Lincoln as, as president. And in addition, uh, newspapers in Illinois in the pre-presidential period, I discovered what I'm pretty sure are at least 200 pieces that Lincoln wrote pseudonymously and anonymously, uh, which helped shed a lot of light on Lincoln's early political career. Now, why do you think that they are Abraham Lincoln's writings and why did he write them anonymously? Well, in, in, the, uh, in the period of, of the 1830s and the 1840s in Illinois, it was quite common for uh, newspapers to be uh, partisan. And the partisan press would run uh, attacks on the enemy that would be quite belittling and quite sarcastic. And, um, and so this was the frontier style. And Lincoln was just following what was fairly common in those days. Uh, and he would pretend that he was somebody else. He would pretend that he's a Democrat. And he would write to another Democrat saying, oh, we're in deep trouble. You know, we've, we've done all kinds of things wrong. And if we don't mend our ways, we're going to go down to defeat at the next election. And of course, it was ludicrous. Uh, uh, but that, that, was, that was frontier politics. Um, and we know that Lincoln wrote for the, for the Springfield Whig newspaper uh, because his law partner, William Herndon, uh, told us that he wrote hundreds, of, he and, and Lincoln both wrote hundreds of pieces for the newspaper. And we know that one of the best men at Lincoln's wedding uh, said that, look, I was the assistant postmaster in Springfield at the time Lincoln was living in New Salem. And I used to deliver dozens and scores of pieces that he would write for the Springfield paper, and I would take them from the post office and take them over to the newspaper office, and uh, they would get published. Now, nobody that I know of has made any systematic attempt to identify those hundreds of pieces. Um, but there are a, a small number that almost everybody agrees were by Lincoln. And if you use those as a base against which to measure these other items, um, you see a similarity in tone and uh, thrust and uh, vocabulary and style. And so I think that uh, it's pretty certain that these were by Lincoln. Michael Burlingame is our guest, and this is a special edition on Book TV, a call-in program. So if you would like to call in and talk to Michael Burlingame, who's just come out with his 1,800-page-plus biography of Abraham Lincoln, 202 is the area code, 737 for those of you in the east and central time zones, 202-737-0002 for the mountain and Pacific time zones. And you can email questions also to Professor Burlingame at booktv.org. Go to uh, uh, our website, booktv.org, and you'll see there a spot where you can email questions to Professor Burlingame. This is his first media appearance about this brand new volume, which is just hitting the stores right now as we speak. And in a, in a little while, we'll uh, give you an opportunity if you'd like to purchase this two-volume set uh, to get a 25% discount. Johns Hopkins Press has given Book TV the opportunity to give you a 25% discount. So we'll give you that information just a little bit later. How many books have been written about Abraham Lincoln in Toto? Uh, the number of books about Lincoln uh, goes into the thousands. I'm not sure the exact number, but it's said that uh, he's the most written about person in uh, English anyway, uh, aside from Napoleon and Jesus. What most fascinates you about Abraham Lincoln? I think the thing that is most fascinating about Lincoln to me is his, is his character and his personality. Uh, to be sure, we honor Lincoln because of his role as the great emancipator, as the savior of, savior of the Union, and as the vindicator of democracy. Uh, but in addition, I find Lincoln uh, admirable and uh, somebody that I, I try to emulate because of his character. And that, that character manifests itself in any of a number of ways. The, the integrity that the man showed, the humor, the humility, the modesty, uh, the capability. And it's, it's traditional to say that Lincoln is an inspirational figure because he did rise from poverty to become an important and powerful man. And anybody who's born into poverty can aspire to achieve similar success. And while that's true, I think there's another aspect of Lincoln that, that I find particularly meaningful, and that is that he overcame emotional poverty. That you don't have to be born into physical poverty to be pretty badly damaged uh, early on. 